Um, just because I had a couple of quick announcements. So if you look at, you guys cannot see over here in class. Let me fix the display. I think the previous teacher likes to keep it separate. There you go. And I just share my screen. Um, but some of the teachers like to have like something on the screen for you guys to see and then other stuff over here for them to see, I guess, like notes. But I'm not that secret, top secret. <laughs> I share with you everything I got. Um, so this is my visualizer. Okay. So the first couple of announcements that I want to do is to talk about, what on earth did I click? Um, let me go back to modules. So I do have an error in here. I thought I had set the dates as October 6th, but for some reason they're October 7th. I'm not gonna leave them as October 7th because we'll be taking, well, I guess it don't matter. I can leave them like that because you won't be taking the test until next Monday, right? Yes. So then I can fix the review to be due on Sunday. And we'll look at that review just a tiny, tiny bit today, but we'll talk about it more on Wednesday. So the test will actually be on Monday. Um, and then I'll leave these due on Friday. So edit, let me change that to Friday. And they're not very long, so it shouldn't take too, too much time to do. Oops, seven. There we go. So... The way it's going to work is today I'm going to cover, I think it's 7.5 and 7.6 today. Both of them are very, very short, so there's not a whole lot in those sections. Um, and then I'll kind of just talk about the review for a little bit after that. And then on Wednesday, hopefully between now and Wednesday, you'll have gone in there and tried the review. And then whatever you have questions about, you can ask those on Wednesday so that we make sure that we understand everything that's in that review, right? Um, and then the test will be the following Monday. So I think that is the 10th, okay? So in a week from now is when we'll have a uh, test two. So I just wanted to go over those announcements. I am gonna have to fix the little dates over here for the for your class, the face-to-face -face class. I think y'all have different dates in here. So your timeline might look a little tiny bit different, but I'll fix it before I leave the room today. Um, so let me stick this down here. There we go. Okay, so with 7.5, 7.5 was about the work section. And so I know that when we went over the reviews or the example videos, um, most of the problems you had examples for. The only one that I noticed that we did not have an example for, um, or just to have an extra example, would be problem four inside WebAssign. So today is the third. And I do apologize if anybody was messaging me. I tried to respond to you today. Um, but this weekend was super, super, super packed. I had my mom's 60th birthday and I threw her a surprise party on Friday. Then my daughter's 16th birthday was on Saturday. And yesterday was just all about cleaning up all the mess. <laughs> so I really did not get around to answering too many folks with their questions. Um, I tried to squeeze in answers here and there as I could, but I think there were a couple that I still had to respond to this morning, but I did respond eventually to everyone. Um, so let me pull up 7.5 so you can see number four, because that's one that I had tagged that I wanted to cover today. Now with number one, I just kind of wanted to give you guys a, it's very straightforward, like work equals force times D, right, distance. 
Um, and so they give you your force and then they give you the distance. So you're literally just multiplying the two things together, right? However, the trick here is that they want the answer in foot pounds, right? And they didn't give you feet and they didn't give you pounds. So you do have to do some conversions with this number of tons and the number of miles. Um, just remember that for the number of tons, it's 2,000 pounds, right, per ton. So that's one thing we needed to know. 2,000 pounds is the same as one ton. And then I don't know why I memorized it, but I did. Um, one mile is 5280. So 5,280 5, feet. Okay. And as long as you have those two conversions, you just convert the two numbers. Once you have those two numbers, you're just multiplying them together. Okay. So that one's not too, too bad. It's just mostly to draw your attention to the units, okay? Um, number two, there was an example in there. You just have to be careful. For this one, you don't need to change any of the units because all they give you is inches and pounds, right? And they do want the air in inch pounds. So no conversions necessary on that one, okay, for number two. For number three, it's the same thing. They give you newtons, they give you centimeters, and they even give you centimeters over here on the questions. So again, no conversions necessary for that one. Number five is a video question, so I'm not gonna go over that one. Um, but this one was interesting because notice that they gave me foot pounds, they gave me inches, and nowhere in the answer does it ask about inches, right? So this one will require us to um do some conversions so i thought this one was a little bit more intense also it's a little bit backwards because they tell me that six and one half or six and one half foot pounds of work is required so they're already telling me what the work is i'm not figuring out what the work is in that first sentence okay so this one was a little bit different so i definitely wanted to cover this one i'm gonna write down these numbers i'm not gonna write down the whole problem but it says six and one half. So I'm gonna write 6.5, right? Six and one half. So 6.5 foot pounds of work, so my W, is required to compress a string six inches from its natural length. And then I'm going to use that information to figure something out. And then eventually they want me to find the work required to compress an additional one half inch. And then it says round your answer to two decimal places. So let me go over to my paper. So again, I didn't write down the whole thing, but I tried to write down all the information. So for number four, we're given the work, okay? You have to remember how you calculate work. When you calculate work, it's from A to B, and then it's your KX DX, right? That's usually how we um, compute work, that's some of the that we use, okay? Now, since it's saying from its natural length, that would tell me that the lower bound would be zero because I haven't moved it at all, right? So I haven't moved it at all. And then it's going to six inches. But remember, your work is in foot pounds, right? So I cannot put inches in my bounds. I would have to put it into feet because it wants foot pounds. So we know that six inches is the same as six over 12 feet, right? which is actually what, 0 0.5 feet? So for my upper bound, I'm only actually doing 0 0.5. But I do not know what K is at all, bless you. I do know what the work is though. It's 6.5 foot pounds. So we're gonna use this equation to help us solve for that K, bless you. Normally they would just give us the force, right? And we could figure out what the K was with that. But this time they kind of threw us for a loop and they gave us work and wanted us to go figure out what that K is, okay? So this is just a constant multiplier. 
So when I'm integrating, I'm also not integrating with respect to K, am I? I'm integrating with respect to X. So you really don't need that K inside the interval. It's just a multiplier. So then when I integrate X, it's going to be X squared over 2. And I do have to plug in my bounds. And so we end up getting 0 0.5 squared divided by 2. Let's see, 0 0.5 squared is 0.25. And if I divide that by 2, I get this number. And when you plug in 0, you're just going to get 0, right? So we have this times this. And if I'm trying to solve for 8K, what do I need to do? Mm -hmm. Just divide by that 0 0.125, right? So then this ends up being in my calculator 52. And so now I know what K is. Now, for me to do this part of the problem, again, it was in foot pounds, right? And even in the box and web assign, it says foot pounds. So when I'm doing that, I need to make sure that my measurements for my bounds are also in feet. So this one half inch is the same thing as one half divided by 12 feet. And what is 0.5 divided by 12? Open oh, a fraction. It's actually going to be 1 over 24 feet. Same thing as this one. Your inches over your feet, your 12 inches to make one foot. Same thing here. My inches over 12 inches to make one foot. And I get 1 over 24. This one's not from the natural length though. Doesn't it say find W to compress an additional one half, right? So if you've already taken your spring and you've already, here's its natural state, you've already compressed it. Um, what is it? 0 0.5 feet, right? The same as six inches. So you've already compressed it this amount, the 0 0.5 feet. Now you wanna compress it a little bit more. So your bounds are actually going to be from 0 0.5 feet to what? Almost this whole distance is going to be 0 0.5 feet plus the 1 over 24 part. Now, I don't know what that number is, though. And I'm probably not going to be able to use decimals. So 0 0.5 plus 1 over 24. Oh, wrong button. That's not good. So let me use the decimal. The decimal is 13 over 24. So you're going from here to here. Okay. You're comparing just that little extra bit more from the point feet or six inches, one half more inch, right? Which puts you at the total length here of 13 over 24 feet. Now in the video, it wasn't as complicated because we didn't have fractions. <laughs> it just had like three inches or two inches. So it didn't have an extra fraction in there, but it's the same idea. You go from where you left off and then add the little bit extra. Now I do know K though, it's 52. And then I write X DX. And so this part's not the hard part. You're gonna get 52 X squared over two from 0 0.5 to 13 over 24. To be consistent, you could use the fraction instead if you really wanted to. So let's see, we get 52 times 13 over 24 squared over two minus 52 1 half squared over two. I have no idea what that is.
over two, and I'm gonna do minus fraction 52 parentheses one over two whole square and put it over two. And it gives me this number, but it does tell me to round to two decimal places. So I'm gonna hit my decimal button and it's actually just 1.13. And again, these are feet and pounds that we converted, right? So it's foot pounds. I think this was the hardest one out of all of them. Just because they actually required conversions. And on top of that, they gave us work instead of force. And then I think I remember Justin asking me about, I think this was from 7.4, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe 7.3 where they gave you this function and it had like the graph and it looked like this. Remember this one? We talked about it the last time. Yes, <laughs> Yep. And what I realized later after the fact was that when they gave you a number here, like let's say they gave you five and seven or something, you didn't need to go to Word and recreate this and find out what the little ticky marks were. Literally, if you just plug in this x value into the function, you would have gotten this y value, which was one fifth. And if you would have plugged this x value into the function, you would have got that guy's y value, which would have been one seventh. I don't know why I didn't think about yeah, that. Yeah, I remember I had stuck it in Word and I was zooming it and putting all the lines and trying to find the little tickies. We didn't need to do any of that. You literally get the y values by plugging these x's into the function. Okay. Because I think you had to use like show method or something and you needed to find out what those bounds were, right? And so you could have found the Y values like that. I don't know why I did not think of it. <laughs> but later on, I was like, what was I doing? I don't know what I was doing. Why I didn't think of that. I mean, that's not on the test, but <laughs> it was in the homework, so. Okay, does anybody have any questions about 7.5? I think this one was the more complicated one of all those four problems. And then the last problem was just the video, right? You look at the video and then you'll be able to answer that, that question. Okay, 7.6 was a little bit different. I tried to write a little summary here. Um, and I also wanted to you guys to make an observation. So, if I go with 7.6, there were basically three different situations for moments and centers of mass, right? So in one dimensional, you basically were just finding the center of the mass and your moment you would get by taking your mass times your location, mass times location, so on and so forth, depending on how many masses and how many points of location you had. And then you could also find the total mass just by adding up all the masses together. And then eventually you could get that center of um, centroid, I think is the word they called it, um, the center of mass by taking this ratio, okay? Then we talked about how to do it when you had two-dimensional things, right? So you're talking about on an XY plane. And normally if you're talking about locations in an XY plane, those are represented by points, right? So they have an X value and a Y value. So then in order for me to find the center of mass, it's gonna be somewhere in that plane. So it's also gonna be a point with an X value and a Y value, okay? And so I gave you the formulas here on how to find that X value of the center of mass and how to find the Y value of the center of mass. M is still the same, it's the total mass. That's not changing, okay? But it's not MO or initial M anymore, it's MX and MY. And so how do we calculate MX and MY? You take the Y location and multiply it by the first, by its corresponding mass, the second Y values location and its mass and so on and so forth. And then for MY, you do the same thing, but with the X value locations, right? The X coordinates and then multiplied by their masses. 
And so I think we did a couple of examples of each one of those in the videos. And then the three-dimensional one is the one that's more complicated, right? Because now you're talking about a three-dimensional space, which even though this is more complicated, this is actually more applicable to real life, right? Because we don't live in 1D and we don't live in 2D, right? We live in 3D. So if I'm going to build something, it's most likely going to be a three-dimensional figure, right? And if you want to find that center of mass so it doesn't topsy over, <laughs> you're probably going to be having to do these calculations, okay? So for here, it's the same thing. I am talking about um, three-dimensional figure, except usually they don't use the height as your measurement. They just take it down onto the uh, X, Y plane, okay? Um, it will get crazier, but I think that's in a later chapter. No, that's in Cal 3. In Cal 3, you'll actually do this where you have an X, Y, and a Z later, okay? Um, so they talk this about uh, the center of mass or lamnia, have you, I, I can never say that, lamina, lamnia, whichever way you pronounce it. <laughs> Not lambda, lambda is different. Lambda is this Greek letter. But lamni, lam, I can't say it. <laughs> the lamnia, it's basically like you took a sheet, okay? And then you bend it or whatever. Um, and you're finding basically the center of mass of that sheet. So it's still kind of within the two-dimensional realm, okay? Um, but it, a sheet, when I bend it, it's no longer in two dimensions. As soon as I bend it, it's in three dimensions, okay? So these have different formulas. And I noticed that you were given this one, but I just wanted you to make an observation that if I were to actually foil this numerator and this, it's basically like a numerator, right? If I put it over one. So if you take the top times the top and you foil it all out, you just end up with F squared minus G squared. And then two times one is still just two. So I tend to use this formula just because it already does all the multiplication for me and I don't have to mess with a lot of the algebra, okay? So I usually use this version of the formula when I work on problems, okay? Um, and then for MY, it's just F minus G, but they have the X attached. And then for little m, the mass, it's F minus G with no extra X, okay? Just F minus G by itself. So normally when I'm doing these calculations, I usually do this one first because it's the easiest one. Then I do this one next because it's the same thing just with an extra factor of X, right? And then eventually the last one I do is that one because that one's more complicated, okay? Um, also pay attention in WebAssign and on the review because these problems do take a while, right, to do. You got to set them up. You got to do all the whole thing. So pay attention into WebAssign and the review because sometimes they don't ask you for all of the parts. Sometimes they don't ask you for X bar and Y bar, although sometimes they do. Sometimes they just ask you randomly, what's MY? Or randomly, what's MX? Or just what's M, okay? And I think there was one in there that asked you for all of them, but it might not like that on the test and on the review because it just takes too long. Okay, so they might just ask you specifically for one. So make sure that you're paying attention to which one they're asking you for, okay? We'll take a look at the review in a little bit too. Um, and then I just, I didn't write F of X and G of X and all the good stuff, but F is literally your top function and G is the bottom function, always. It should always be top minus bottom, right? So when you see those F minus Gs, understand it has to be the top one minus the bottom one, okay? Um, because of that, you have to graph them so that you know which one's on top and which one's on bottom, okay? Some people don't graph them. They just do a little chart and they plug in the X values and they say, oh, this X value, these Y values are higher and these Y values are lower. So the higher Y values is the top function, right? And the lower Y values is the bottom function. And so you can do it that way, but me, I'm, I'm photographic, so I have to do it a graph okay um so let me see i wanted to pick one of the problems to work out but i didn't want to pick the exact ones we had already done in the videos so i think i picked two of them i definitely wanted to talk about number three um 
I was messing with the student and he asked me if it was right and I put it in there. I was like, nope, it's not right. <laughs> um, but they saw this problem here with the children and all that. So it says, consider a beam of length L with a fulcrum X feet from one end and it shows you the figure. So this many feet from one end is where the fulcrum is at. And then of course, if I know what the whole length of that board is, is this would just be the leftovers, right? So that whole length minus however far you traveled so far. So that's represented by L minus X. Um, and it says there are objects with weights, a W1 and W2, placed on opposite ends of the beam. And so we see those there. And it says find X such that the system is in equilibrium. Now it says two children weighing 52 pounds and 78 pounds are going to play on a seesaw that is 10 feet long. Now, I do need to mention that the size of those little boxes is important because you notice one of them is smaller than the other, right? So you have to imagine that this is literal, like one of these kids, they're not a box, but one of these kids is a lower weight, right, than the other kid. So for the left-hand side, that's obviously a smaller weight, right? So that's going to be the kid that weighs just the 52 pounds. And then the big box, the green, that one would have to be the bigger kid. And so that one would have to be the 78 pound kid, okay? So I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. 7.6, number three. So here's how it's going to get worked out. And it's really not complicated. <laughs> if you need one mass and the other mass to be the same, right? Their moments need to be the same. You're basically just doing X1 times M1 or W1. Instead of mass, they use the word weight. Same thing. And then X2 and then weight two. And to find where their equilibrium is basically to find where the two things are equal, right? So for X1, this is actually the distance. For the first side, it's just X, okay? And that weight of the not so heavy kid was 58 pounds. Was it 58? 52. 52, there we go. So that would have been this guy's weight, which is 52. Now the other though has a different distance. I think they used L minus X, right? And that guy's weight was 78, okay? Now this can be written as 52 X. And don't I know what L is? I believe they did tell me what the length was. Ten. Mm-hmm. It said that it the seesaw is ten feet long. Okay, so I do know what L is. It's going to be ten. And then this is a right-handed distribution. So it's not too bad, right? You're just solving a linear equation. It's not anything too crazy. But when I add 78 over, it's 130. And then if you divide both sides by 130, you end up with x equal to just 6. And so that's probably why it didn't tell me to round or anything because it just came out to a little nice number, okay? But that's how you would work out number three. But I didn't cover that in the video. So I wanted to know you had an example, okay? Now, the other one that's more complicated is think further down in the homework. So this one, I do have a video, right? You use the X values times the masses, the Y values times the masses that we've already covered. Here, it's the same exact thing, just different numbers. We did do, we actually did this one. Just, it might've had different numbers um, on the video, but it was the same. Font. It was a radical plus a number, a fraction um, times X plus another number. And so we did do one like that in the video. The one I wanna cover, and this one's not very difficult to figure out who the top and the bottom is. If you have one eighth X and zero as your two functions, wouldn't zero be at the bottom? Yeah. 
right? So that one's not too, too bad. But I definitely wanted to try to use number seven as the example that we covered today, okay? Let me see, 7.6, number 10, and let me write down these numbers. So I have y equals x to the fourth and y equals x to the seventh, and they want all of it. They want mx, they want my, and they want x bar, y bar. So the thing that I find is actually none of those three. <laughs> the first thing that I find is M, which is this formula. But I cannot determine who's the F and who's the G until I know which function is on top and which function is on bottom, right? And if I want to know what the intervals are for my bounds, I definitely, for me personally, need to see it, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is over here on the side is I'm going to take one function equal to the other function to find those points of intersection, right? Because those points of intersection are going to be what creates our region, right? They're like our little bounds. So if I minus the x to the fourth over, I get this function or this equation. And then if I factor out an x to the fourth, I get x to the third minus one. And if I set each of those equal to zero, this one will give me just zero, right? And this one will give me one for x. So I get two values, zero and one. So then when I draw this, here's zero. When I plug in one to either of those two functions, I'm just gonna end up with one, right? So I'm gonna make my units pretty big so I can see what's going on in between zero and one. So if I pick a number in the middle, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So one, two, three, That's about a half, right? So that's about a half. So if I plug in, this is what I was saying. If you know your bounds are zero and one, you could have just made a table instead of drawing it. You have zero and one in your table and then somebody in between so that, because you know they equal each other at zero and one, right? Because we set them equal to each other. But we need to find somebody in the middle so we can know who's on the top and who's on the bottom, okay? So if I raise zero to the fourth power, it's still zero. And if I raise it to the seventh power, it's still zero. If I raise one to the fourth power, it's one. And the same for raising one to the seventh power, right? But it's a 0 0.5 that's really gonna help us figure this out. So if I do 0 0.5 raised to the fourth, I get 0 0.0625. If I raise 0 0.5 to the seventh power, I get 0 0.0078125. I'm trying to squeeze it in there. <laughs> but between these two numbers, which one's bigger? Mm -hmm. This one's the bigger one, right? So where's 0 0.65? They're still very close. So one's going like this but the other one's going like even lower, right? And the top one is y equals x to the fourth, and the bottom one is y equals x to the seventh. And I need to know which one's on top and which one's on bottom. Now, whether you did it in a graph or whether you just determine that with people, it's totally okay. So now I know that my f function is going to be the x to the fourth, the G function is going to be X to the seventh. And I need to know that before I can just start plugging it in. And you have to be careful because some people just say, oh, X to the seventh has a higher exponent. So the Y values are going to be higher. 
Normally that's true for any number bigger than one, but that's not true for numbers between zero and one. X to the seventh is not bigger, okay? And so a lot of times people will put the wrong one as the top function just because it had the higher power, okay? So you definitely have to make sure that you're talking about who's the bigger guy within these points of intersection. Okay, now from here, it's not the bad part. Really figuring out who's top and bottom is the hard part. Um, I know my bounds, right? What are the bounds? It's from zero to one. I know my top function is gonna be X to the fourth and the bottom X to the seventh. And so then I'm gonna do X to the fifth over five and X to the eighth over eight and evaluate it from zero to one. Now, when I plug in one, I'm gonna get one fifth and then one eighth. But when I plug in zeros, I'm just gonna get two zeros. So there's really nothing to subtract. Three minus five, or no, eight minus five is three over 40. So this is my mass. Now they did not ask me for the little mass. I just know what it is and I'm gonna need it, right? In order to find X bar and Y bar. But now we have to go figure out what MX is and MY is. Now, where's that little formula sheet that I just had? So I like to find MY next because it's not as bad. It's the same exact uh, integral. It's just, I have an extra factor of X, okay? So everything is exactly the same for MY. Same thing, zero to one, X to the fourth minus X to the seventh. I have a little factor extra of X in the front, okay? Which does change those powers, right? So it becomes X to the fifth minus X to the eighth. So that when you integrate, now they have even higher powers, right? This one will become x to the 6 over 6, and this one will become x to the 9 over 9. From 0 to 1. So again, when you plug in the 1s, you're going to get 1 6 minus 1 ninth. When you plug in the zeros, you're going to get zero for both. And I would get three over 54, which I think reduces. Yep, so we get row over 18. That's MY. So I do have one of the pieces that they asked me for. I do know that MY is gonna be rho over 18. MX is the one that's a little bit more complicated, but I think if you use that alternative version, it's not as bad. So when I set up MX, I'm actually gonna use, let me write it over here. I'm actually gonna use this version of the formula for MX, where I'm just doing F squared is G squared over two, okay? So it's zero to one, and then F was X to the fourth, and G was X to the seventh, all over two. Now the two is just a constant. It's like multiplying by a one half, right? So I can kick out the two over there with the row. And if I square these, remember when you have an exponent squared, you actually multiply those guys. Again, exponent squared, I'm going to multiply those exponents. I don't know why I wrote 17. It should be 14. 7 times 2 is 14. So 
So then we get x to the 9 over 9 minus x to the 15 over 15 from 0 to 1. When I plug in 1, I'll get 1 ninth minus 1 15th. And then when I plug in zeros, I'm basically subtracting one big fat zero, right? 15 minus 9 is 6, and 9 times 15 is 135. These can reduce 3 over 135, can also reduce. I end up with row over 45. So I have MX, MX is rho over 45. Now all I have to do is find X bar and Y bar. And so these are the opposite. You have to remember they're the opposite. So if you're trying to find X bar, you need to put MY over M, okay? I don't like to do the fraction like this. I like to do MY divided by M because both of my M, and my my are fractions, aren't they? And so I don't like to have a double fraction. I like to just write one fraction divided by the other fraction. So my was rho over 18. And m was here. And it was 3 rho over 40. So for fractions, you have to keep the first one the same, change it to multiplication, and then flip the other one over, right? that multiplying by the reciprocal idea. So of course these guys cancel. And I don't know if 40 over 18 reduces, I'm sure it reduces just by two. So this reduces by two, this reduces by two. And we end up with 20 on top and nine times three on the bottom. So 27, that's for X bar. Now for y bar, it's the same thing, but now you're doing mx divided by m. So mx was rho over 45, and then m was still three rho over 40. So you do keep, change, flip. If I divide this by five, I get eight. If I divide this by five, I get nine and the rows do cancel or reduce. So I have eight over 27. So eight over 27. So it's annoying because it's super long, right? But it's not anything particularly difficult it's just making sure that you know who the top function is and who the bottom function is before you start putting them into those formulas. And then trying to do it all without losing focus, right? That's the big thing. Okay, does everybody got it? All copied? Okay, cool. Um, so that's it. I mean, does anybody have any other questions for 7.6? I think this one was the trickier one out of all of those because of being able to identify who was top and who was bottom is not intuitive. 
right? You see x to the seventh, you're like, that's got to have higher y values. And so you tend to naturally want to put that one as the top one, but it just doesn't work that way in the interval they gave us or the interval we found. Okay, I do have one quick thing though I need to mention in this problem. What if, what if they gave me What if they gave me this? When I go to figure out my bounds, I'm gonna set them equal to each other, right? And then we're gonna minus this one over. And then we're gonna factor out that X cubed. And that would leave me with X squared minus one, right? So when you set this one equal to zero, you just get x equals zero, right? But when you set this one equal to zero, you actually get x equals plus or minus one, don't you? So this one is more is a little bit more different. You have y equals x cubed and y equals x to the fifth, but you know that they're going to intersect at negative one, zero, and one. And I promise you, chances are that that top function is going to change from one side of zero to the other side of zero. And if that happens, guess what? On all of your M, MY, and MX formulas, you're going to have to separate it into two of them. One from negative one to zero, and then one from zero to one. Okay? So you'll have two intervals for each, each part. Okay? And chances are, because if I put negative 0 0.5 and positive 0 0.5 in here, watch what happens. Negative one raised to odd powers is still gonna be negative one. Zero raised to any power is still zero. And one raised to any power is still one, right? But it's the negative 0 0.5 cubed that gives me this number and negative 0 0.5 to the fifth gives me this number. So you notice that here in this interval, um, y equals x cubed is on top, right? Because that number is bigger than that number, isn't it? Okay. But if now I try to do it with positive 0 0.5, well, it's the same things. Actually, no, I'm wrong. Who's bigger? It's weird because they're negatives, so be careful. I just did it. <laughs> I just messed up. So from here, yes, y equals x cubed is on top because this y value is bigger than that y value. But when you're talking about negatives, isn't the further negative going to be lower on the y axis, right? So for here, it's actually x to the fifth that's on top. Okay. So when you do f minus g, for this interval, negative one to zero, it's going to have to be x to the fifth minus the cubed. And down here, x cubed is on top. So from zero to one, it's going to be x cubed minus x to the fifth dx. Okay. So you have to be very, very, very careful. But x cubed and x to the fifth are both odd functions which means that if I'm talking about this and this, you know, whatever, there's another one, right? This space in here is exactly the same as this space in there. So instead of doing two, what's your other option that we learned in one of those sections? Uh-huh. So you could avoid that one and just two in front of this. Of course, it already has a row, right? And then you would be finding the whole complete um, area of that. Okay, so you don't have to necessarily do it in two separate ones. You can use the symmetry and just have to do one in a row. You have to double it. Dude, only when they're odd functions do they have that symmetry. Even functions have that symmetry too, but it would have to be like you were trying to find like this area and then that area, right? So even functions have symmetry as well. Mm -hmm. 
Odd functions just have it like across the origin. So this is going to match that. And whatever's over here will match that. And evens are across the y axis. So this left side should match the right side. But still, it's symmetric, right? Yeah. That one region is going to be the same area as the other region. Okay. I just wanted to mention it in case you got odd functions like that <laughs> and it came out a little bit different. If they're both odd or both even, this will happen. But if you have one odd and one even exponent, then it doesn't happen. Like it didn't happen to us, right? When we drew it, we just only got these two points of intersection and that was it. It's only when they're both odd or they're both even that you'll get three points of intersection, okay? But it's worth mentioning because it randomizes those left or those exponents. I don't know which exponents you're gonna get. we're going to talk about the review. I'm just going to kind of gloss over it. I'm not going to go over the problems. If you go over the review and you are struggling with the particular problem, let us know on Wednesday so we could talk about it, okay? Because I want you guys to know what's going on before you take the test, okay? If you completely finish the review and you get at least a 70 on it, then you can ask me to see the solutions, okay? And I'll send you the solutions. And the reason why I'm doing that is so that you have an idea of what needs to be written down, I guess, when you take the test. Now, you never have to do it exactly the way I do it, but at least you have an idea of the depth of explanation I'm expecting, okay? Not that you have to do all of your steps exactly like me. Um, I also wanted to point out the rubric for the problems because test only has seven questions okay I think the review has 10 but the actual test only has seven and so because of that they're graded a little bit weird that just make them all 10 points um so what I did was I ended up making problems one four five six and seven worth 12 points each and then problems three two and three are actually worth 20 points each and that's because two and three are the ones that have to do with the uh, solids of revolution. And those are really, really complicated. So I figured you should be getting a lot of points if you're able to figure those two problems out because they're real big ones. You have to show me how you know which one's top and bottom. You have to show me all the setup of the integration. You have to actually integrate it and then you have to evaluate it, right? So those are really, really long problems. So I felt like those were the ones that needed to have a little bit of more weight they're also the big ideas in the whole chapter, okay? There's a lot of other little ideas we learned, but those are like the main one is the solids of revolution. Um, and mostly because that's what you're gonna be using if you're an engineer. I mean, when you go to that 3D printer, you're basically doing that. You have one kind of graph, like an image, and then revolve it around a certain um, axis and it's gonna create that three-dimensional figure in the 3D printer. So you kind of have to have an idea of what's, what's all going on there, okay? Um, so this is the way the rubric works is um, the answer that you type in or that you select will get you two points if you got the correct actual numerical answer and you typed it in there correctly. Because I had a few people that did not follow directions on the first test. Like I said, type in this, no space, semicolon, whatever. And then people were spacing and not putting the semicolon or whatever. They just weren't following the directions on how to input the answer. But I didn't think that you should lose the credit just because you didn't follow all the credit because you didn't follow the directions on how to type it in. So I did separate the answer part into two. So one point, if you got the right answer and typed it in, you get two points total. And then one point, if you got the correct answer, but you just weren't able to put it in correctly, um, and then, of course, no points if the answer you got is just not incorrect or you just didn't answer the question at all, okay? You won't get those points for the answer. Notation is always still a big thing, so make sure you're putting your dx's at the end of your integrals, right? It's like an open parenthesis is that long s and the closed parenthesis is the dx. I need to know where it's opening and closing. If you're integrating more than one term, those terms need to be in parentheses so that you're telling me I'm integrating all of this. Okay. Um, 
So normally I give two credit, two points credit if there's like no problems with notation at all. Um, if there is a problem with notation, I usually give you one credit. Really, the only time I give you zero points is if you just didn't show anything at all or like everything was just chicken scratch. It doesn't, it's like not <laughs> anything that should have been turned in. That's really the only time I'll ever give zero points for notation. It's usually just one or two. Okay. Um, and then the explanation logic. So I tried to like break it down as to what I'm looking for. So of course, full credit is going to be all you have all the adequate steps shown with no errors. So you did the setup correct, you did the integration correct, and you did the evaluation correct. So of course you got the correct answer most likely, right? Um, then if there's like one arithmetic error, you're gonna get six points from that. If there is more than one arithmetic error, or if there's one algebraic error, then you'll get four points for that. And if there's adequate steps shown, but one, conceptual error, meaning like maybe you took the integral wrong, right? Um, that would be a conceptual error because then you're not, you didn't understand how to apply an integration rule. And that is the stuff we're learning right now, right? Um, so that would be like the two point problem. Um, and then step one point is basically like, you didn't show me enough, but I gotta give you credit for doing something, right? <laughs> so I usually give the one credit. Um, or if there's like multiple errors. So you got like an arithmetic error, an algebraic error, and a conceptual error, like that's that's too many X's, right? So you'll just get one step, one point for those for that work. And zero, I only ever give zero points for explanations if there's absolutely nothing given, like nothing. You just didn't even explain the answer at all. Okay. Um, so be careful because you could type in the correct answer but you're gonna get no points for notation because you didn't write anything and no points for your explanation. So all your, whatever it was you did to get that correct answer will just earn you two points out of 12. So it's not good, okay? You do have to show your steps. This one was harder. <laughs> I really had to break it down. Um, so I tried this, okay? So for these, I did it a little bit different because you're gonna be doing a lot of work to do those uh, solids of revolution. So for this one, I gave you three points if you gave me the correct answer and it was typed in right. Like if I asked for a fraction, it gave me a fraction. If I asked for decimals, it gave me decimals, whatever it is. Um, two points if the direct if the correct answer is correct, but it just wasn't inputted correct. Um, one point if it's just incorrect, but you had to have tried something, okay? So you're not gonna get that point unless you actually like tried to do something because I think you should still get a point even if your answer is wrong, just because these are really, really hard to work out, okay? And then of course, zero, the only time you're gonna get zero points is if you just did not answer the question at all, you left it blank, okay? Um, notation, again, this one's gonna be weird too. So I have correct notation is three points. One point is if there's just one notation error and then one point if there's multiple or even repeated notation errors. So like if you're forgetting DX on every single step, it's just all counted as one thing, okay? It's one point if that's happening. And then of course, zero points if you didn't even write anything down. So everything's missing. Um, then I did two points for your bounds. So either you got both of the bounds correct or maybe you got them incorrect, but you still had them there. And then zero if they're just missing altogether. Um, the variable of integration. So. If it's telling you to do it with respect with shell, you need to know whether you're using dx or dy, right? Then depending on the graph, okay? And depending on that line of revolution. So if you're doing everything in dx and actually the problem required you to be doing it in dy, you could get some points missed there, right? Um, so two points if you have the correct integral of um, variable of integration, one if it's incorrect, and then again, zero if you just didn't do it at all. Then the integral setup, so this is just the integrand. It's what you're taking the integral of, okay? So what's between the long S and the DX, right? Did you do top function minus bottom function correctly? That whole good stuff, okay? If it was shell method, did you get the height and the row correct? Okay, that's just me looking at the integrand. So three points if it's correct, two points if it's almost there, one point if it's just incorrect, and of course zero if it's just missing altogether. Then finally, your integration step. So I need to know if you made like an arithmetic error when you were trying to simplify your integral, 
um, or if you made an actual integration rule error, or if there's just a whole bunch of things going wrong. Okay, so we've got all the rubric there. And then finally, the evaluation. So you might have done your integral correct, but then when you plugged in the numbers, something might have went wrong. Um, that's two points as well. And so if something went wrong, it would still be worth one point. Okay. So this is literally what I have printed out next to me so that as I'm grading, I'm making sure that I'm giving people all the right amount of points, okay? But I wanted you guys to see it before you saw the test. So that way you kind of had an idea of what's going on there, okay? Um, so this is not the rubric for the review. It's just the rubric for the test. The review is just gonna grade you and then whatever you get, you get, okay? Um, I do have that one rule. So all the basic differentiation rules are in there. You've got your integral rules. Um, I tell you the formula for the area between two functions. I give you the disk method. They didn't have a whole nice little picture thing for washer method. So only had this one version of the washer method. Okay. But we know that if we're doing it with respect to dy, it's the same stuff, but it'll be a function in terms of y, right? And then dy. Um, and then this one had a nice little picture for shell method, but it never gave me, um, oh no, this is the washer. So there's the washer. I drew, I got a picture of washer. And then I'm telling you the formula for the different uh, axes of revolution, okay? So you do have over there for both um, lines of revolution. I don't know why this little box is there because it's the same thing down here. Isn't it the same thing, right? So I don't know why it's there twice, but it's there twice. <laughs> and then with respect to why is there once. Okay. Shell method is in here. Also gives you a cute little photo. Um, then we have the arc length formulas. So again, depending on which variable of integration you're using, there's two formulas. The work, we have the basic work formula. And then we have Hooke's law, which is for the springs, right? because those are the common thing we had was the springs. Um, and then there's your formula to find the work using Hooke's law. All we have to remember is that that capital F function is K times D, which we usually used as K times X, right? So it is there. Then your moments and centers of mass for just points are here, or just X values. For the points for the two-dimensional system, it's there. And then for the, I cannot say this word, planar, lamnia, or lamia, I, I can't, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> you've got all the three formulas that you need over here, too. okay? So they give you mx, they give you my, and then they even give you m. Now, you don't have to use this version of mx. You could use the f squared minus g squared over 2. It's equivalent to that one, okay? It's just like multiplying this times this, you'd get F squared minus G squared. And then that's it. So we've got area between a curve. We've got a disc washer problem, um, another disc washer problem. We've got a shell method one, another shell method one. Um, here we've got an arc length, arc length, Hooke's law, centers of mass, and then the centers of mass, lamine. I can't say that word. <laughs> oh, look, and it's the same exact problem we did. <laughs> um, so definitely try these problems, okay? Um, there are 10 of them here, but only seven of them are going to make it to the actual test. And of course, they're not going to be the exact same functions, right? They might be a little tiny bit different. So be careful, but definitely take a look at that review, okay? Does anybody have any questions for me? right now. I no? A question, but it's, sure. Uh, um, I didn't get to do 7.4. Um, I think it's for my deadline. I still wanted to try it, but it, I don't know if I can it. Did you, what is What happens when you click on it? It's a type of it, it'll give you the answer. I 
I don't think I can. I think you'll have to just ignore whatever is in the answer key and then just try it and then see if your answer matches whatever it is they got in the answer key. Yep, yep, yep. Because I don't think I can make the answer key go away. Any other questions? Sure. Mm -hmm. Say we're doing watch mm -hmm. So if we mess up, mm -hmm. so somewhere in the middle, we get the uh, they uh, going minus small or wrong. Mm -hmm. Still go through with the rest of the process, right? Mm -hmm. Only lose the points for doing that. Right. If you're integrand, you're in. A, I can't say that word. <laughs> integrand, whatever you're taking the integral of the top and bottom part. Yes. If you get that wrong, you only get one point for that one part. But then whatever you have, if you integrated it correctly, then you would get all of the five points for the integration part. Because you did take the integral correctly, you took the integral of the wrong thing. Okay, you see what I'm saying? So yes, I do give you the points where the points are due. Okay, and of course, an answer is not going to be correct, so you might lose some points up there and in this part. So you might lose a point up here, or actually two points. You might lose two points up here, and you might lose um probably two points in here. But as long as that step is correct and this step is correct, you could still get those other seven points. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Any other questions? No? Okay, we'll try the review. And if you do come up with questions, bring them with you on Wednesday, okay? and then we can answer those. You can choose right now because it, we finished early, right? So you can either choose to stay and work on WebAssign for 7.5 and 7.6, or you can, you're can you free to go and you can go work on it on your own, whether it be at home or in half world or wherever, um, but that's your choice, okay? But I am formally like dismissing class, okay? So if you wanna go on and do it on your own, you're free to go, okay? I'm gonna stop the recording as well. Thank you guys for remoting in. Thank you. Thank you.